Okay, good day everyone everywhere and special greetings to all those seated in heavenly places in Jesus our Messiah. The name of this broadcast is Cross the Border and today is our live Prophecy Reality Edition. Anyway, what are we going to talk about today? Well, a little bit of everything. Uh, we got a lot going on in the news. The, the mainstream uh, news media is going absolutely insane. Uh, over the uh, Helsinki summit between uh, Donald Trump and and uh, President of Russia Putin, <laughs> and uh, you you can tell they loved Obama. Yeah, they could. I mean, because they were they were in the same bed as Obama. They could never. It didn't matter what Obama did. They could never say a bad word about him. But uh, President Trump makes one little slip up or. Uh, says that they, uh, America has made some mistakes. Suddenly he's a traitor. They want to end the, uh, end the world as we know it. And, uh, he's listening to, uh, True News and he says that, uh, w that the Freemasons and the, uh, well, what is it, the Judaizers are, uh, trying to start a Jacobin revolution. And I think he has his history a little bit mixed up, but, about the Jacobin or the French Revolution, uh, a Jacobin revolution happening here in America. Well, I think we got that revolution with Obama. Um, he's just thinking that we're going to have all the bloodshed and everything. And you know, it, it could happen. Yeah, where's everybody? All those notices I sent out. Nobody's in the room yet. Okay, well, uh, come on over to firstmemoradio.com and uh, click on the chat button there and join us in the chat room. So I really don't have an agenda today. Um, first hour, I'm just going to talk about news items. They call in. There's a number up there. You can call in and join me. We can talk about anything you'd like to talk about. Uh, thank you, uh, Dale and Carrie Hand, for coming on in. And uh, anyway, second hour, we're going to jump back into the history of a apocalyptic interpretation by E.B. Elliott. Yes. And uh, we're going to continue and try to finish up uh, the section on Joachim Abbas. It's a, a pretty long uh, section. He did a lot of writing, uh, more writing probably than uh, most, on uh, specifically on the apocalypse. So there's much to be noted on because the book is called The History of Apocalyptic Interpretation. So if someone wrote on apocalyptic interpretation, and did something noteworthy, whether it was right or wrong, yeah, um, we, we have a commentary on it. So just because they wrote it doesn't mean it was right. So don't get that. That's, that's why you read the whole history and you can see uh, uh, how the history of apocalyptic interpretation developed. Um, okay, what else? Anybody got anything they want to talk about? Um, I don't know. The... the the, what's going on with Trump and the news media. Um, I think that's being done to death. I notice how uh, you don't find in really anyone harping on the fact that Hillary Clinton got $500 million donation from Russia for her campaign. Um, well, I think they had much less than the word of a world leader to try to indict Trump's campaign for Russian collusion or whatever and all that nonsense, but I'm not sure it all really makes any sense. Kind of feel sorry for Donald Trump and what he has to go through there. Um, let's see, what else we got in the news today? Uh, not a whole lot going on, on in the news to comment on. So I really, unless someone wants to call in and talk about something in the news, I really don't see a whole lot going on there that is, as far as I'm concerned, newsworthy. And I'll leave the, uh, the political intrigue of the White House to true news. Uh, it's been rather interesting, but a lot of it is just gets uh, very repetitious. Um, I've, I've often thought of the news as just the regurgitation of facts. And when the same news source starts to, you know, say the same thing for the 10th time, it gets kind of old. I think that's why most people are turning to uh, alternate news on the Internet. Anyway. Okay. 
Well, what kind of what I wanted to talk about today was uh, uh, got the whole political scene making America great and American exceptionalism, uh, especially in Christianity and in uh, the evangelical church. Uh, most of them consider themselves Protestants. I heard news pieces about um, Southern Baptist Convention being the largest Protestant denomination in America and the reasons that they grew. But I noted they called themselves Protestant. But I know that most of them are futurists, and therefore there is no protest whatsoever. Uh, they believe in that the people of the church today believe when they say that God has not appointed us to wrath. They believe that that somehow is an indication that they will be raptured out before all of the calamity that is actually outlined for the uh, days immediately preceding the return of Christ, or for that matter, all of the calamity outlined in the entire uh, book of Revelation okay, is going to happen in a three and a half or seven year period that is about to break upon the world when they start to build the third temple. Okay, They're all going to be raptured out. And th they've They've mistranslated that because they read, God has not appointed us to wrath, and it, that's what it says, and I believe that because the wrath of God is not for the, for the righteous, it's not for the elect, but it's for those wicked that uh, reject the only begotten Son of God and what he did to pay for their sins on the cross. Okay? That's who the wrath is for. But see, they read it that God has not appointed us to persecution. God has not appointed us to tribulation. God has not appointed us to martyrdom. All of these things which have visited the church in the hundreds of millions, uh, speaking of even just simply martyr deaths, uh, by the hundreds of millions in the last 2,000 years and, and many dying for their faith today, somehow we get an escape card. We get to, as the American Evangelical Church, when I say we, I'm, I'm speaking for them, really, and uh, Baptists, non-denominationals, and uh, all evangelicals alike, uh, because they hold to futurism, which is basically a new doctrine. You know, we've been going through this, the history of the apocalyptic interpretation, and uh, a lot of the, uh, a lot of the futurists, they they, they say that, well, the early church fathers were futurists too. They believe what we believe. They established futurism. Well, that's not true because the futurism that you believe in today did not even exist then. Most of them believed, yes, that the coming of Christ was imminent. They in no way believed that they would be here for 1260 days. I mean, 1260 years. So, in order to go with that belief and their, the imminent return of Christ, which was their belief, they would interpret it as 1200, three and a half years, the 1260 days. So they were waiting for an antichrist to rise. Okay? That's not the same futurism you have. Okay. So, but as you go through this book, the history of apocalyptic interpretation, you see that about the time that they, and before the kingdom split into ten, and even before that, they didn't know how long it would take for the kingdom to split into ten. They didn't, they didn't see that happening in five or six hundred years. Uh, they figured when it happened, then they would have three and a half years. Okay? But prophecy interpretation developed over the last two thousand years. And these people are still thinking like Jesus just left and he's going to be returning any day. And it has to be three and a half years because the return of Christ is so imminent. Okay? That's uh, what they believe. But you know, God, if you're martyred, if you have to go through tribulation, if world war hits, if America is judged, we see the judgment of God fall continually. If you Now, I just finished... Um, uh, we have Cross the Border Publishing. It's a, a major part of the work I do here is uh, publishing and updating 
uh, I've been updating the Hori Apocalyptica, and this is the Quincentennial edition. It says Reformation Quincentennial edition right there. Can't see that on the camera very well, but if you go to my website, there's a link where you can see it. And we finally published this, uh, all four volumes. Uh, we just published this last weekend, four, volume four was, and I still haven't got my review copy yet before it goes into distribution, but you can still buy it by going to my author page on Lulu, but you can see the link there on my website. So, and I know many people have got one, volume one, two, and three as I publish them, and uh, many are waiting for volume four. Well, it's out there now, okay? Uh, and we did a substantial amount of revision. In volumes one and two, no revision was necessary because he had the, it was all history, and it was the verification of history. Uh, some things, and starting in volume three and four, uh, he started to speculate and try to fit some things that were yet future into the past, but never could quite make it work. And so we've corrected that in volume three and four because, well, with a with an additional hundred and fifty plus years, uh, then um, yeah, with an additional hundred and fifty plus years, we've seen the more more development of prophecy uh, being fulfilled. And speaking of which, um, we know uh, the Jacobin Revolution, which we were speaking of earlier, that many people think. I mean. If the media and the, the, the what they call the deep state uh, or the Jesuits, because they're really the, the Jesuits and the Antichrist are behind the deep state and the media, okay? Let's just call them out. Let's not leave it some nefarious or ubiquitous deep state and uh, talk about the, uh, the um, Freemasons and the Jacobins. Okay, the Jacobins, um, yes, they exist today. All, all of the, all of the, the um, mainstream media, they are Jacobin. They love communism, but communism is the Antichrist form of government. The Bible tells us that. Absolutely. If you go to chapter 13 of the Revelation, and you read about the mark of the beast, and how everyone is forced or required to have a mark, in order to buy and sell, that's communism. See, because communism re removes all of your financial freedom. You can't own your money anymore. That's why the gold and the silver are taken away, because you could own that money. Now you have Federal Reserve notes, and it says right on the face of it that you don't own it. So you don't own the money. And the, Well, they definitely want it all digital now. Nobody will own their money. As a matter of fact, if you save money, They'll charge you to keep it in your bank account with negative interest rates. That's the way you see that's happening now. And they want you to keep that money moving, those digits moving around. And the theft of socialism is part of communist, uh, antichrist monetary thought because they're stealing from the people. When you work for a dollar one day and you come, if you try to save that for six months, it's going to have been eroded. Just look at how how fast the money is eroding. How much more food costs this year? I mean, I think prices have doubled in the last uh, ten years, at least doubled. The last ten, fourteen years, from from my observation, everything has doubled or more than doubled. That's how fast they're stealing from the people by the creation of their fiat usury currency, just creating it out of thin air to finance the the Antichrist monetary system, and, and who can deny it? I mean, doesn't the Bible say in chapter 13 of the Revelation that the Antichrist will control the monetary system in so much with his help of the beast and the second beast of Revelation that come alongside and work together to support the Antichrist monetary system so that everyone will be required? And see, this is this is why we're having all of these problems. And there's a threat of a Jacobin revolution in America now. And we, what they want to do is incite to bloodshed because that's, that's the Jacobin revolution that they're looking for. That's what we got in the French Revolution, our last Jacobin revolution. 
that spread all over the world. Okay? They got bloodshed. And who did they kill? Well, they killed... Well, I mean, actually, the, the scripture, if you read E.B. Eliot, and you come to an understanding that it was the judgment on the Catholic Church, uh, that's, that's when the Catholic Church was judged. And it was judged. Judgment fell on the seat of the beast. And the seat of the beast was the Catholic Church. It was the Vatican. And also called Rome and the Roman Catholic Church. So the judgment hit hard. And they repented not of their sins. So what did they get? More wars. 30 years wars. Wars all over Europe. Continuing to this very day. The judgment continues to fall on the old world Roman Empire that repented not of their sins. And now they have their, their Islamic invasion. God is historically, again, going to, you know, this set here, you know, the, the Hori Apocalyptica, four volume set, written by E.B. Eliot, rightly dividing, uh, that which had already been fulfilled in history. Okay. That's what he did. And, uh, uh, we learn that God used Islam to judge idolaters in his church, those that worship saints and statues and, and transubstantiation. All of those that had the mark of the beast were judged. That's what the judgment was all about. Um, that's why we read books like this so we could understand. Uh, these books you can get, you can get for free. And, you know, especially if you're a futurist and you believe in the rapture, hey, aren't you interested that there might be something else out there that you might be interested? We have the last prophecy. Is the Hori Apocalyptica condensed? It is a 30 lectures on the Hori Apocalyptica. You can get this free, or you can buy this for like 10 bucks, this little version here at the bookstore on my website. But I give you a copy for free. Go to my website and there's a page there that says uh, free ebook tab. You can ask for anything we publish in a PDF and we will get it. Uh, Dale says, where's the producer? <laughs> You're looking at him. I am the producer. Um, also another great work is History Unveiling Prophecy, which we've updated somewhat to by H. Grattan Guineas, or Time as an Interpreter, showing you, uh, going through the scripture. See, because if you, if you've read your Bible, and many of you have, uh, even most, even, even most evangelicals have read probably good portions of the Bible, or they've heard expository teaching in their church, or maybe they haven't heard anything. Maybe they're more like Catholics who never read the Bible. Very few Catholics read the Bible. They, they don't really promote reading the Bible in the Catholic Church. Because if people read the Bible, well, it's, it's kind of hard to change everything in it because people could actually be saved uh, even by reading a Catholic Bible. You know, they've changed some things, but still the Spirit of God can work through it because he said, my word shall not return to me void. And God calls people out of that church. Um and he said, come out of her, my people. That's who he was talking to. So, I mean, you can get this book here, uh, History of Apocalyptic Interpretation. This is like 210 pages. Gives you an overview of history and prophecy. The Bible is a book of history beginning with Genesis called uh, Genesis means beginnings. Takes you back to the history of the founding and the creation of the world. And shows you how God actually literally created the heavens and the earth and everything on them uh, and time as we know it in the in six day, creation days and how he rested on the seventh day. And then we go through the Genesis and the Exodus and, and we follow that history. And so the, the Bible is a book of history. And then God started giving to the prophets in Israel history in advance. He gave a little bit of history in advance there to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden and the seed of the woman. A little bit hard to understand, but you know I'm sure that when he preached that sermon to him, when he had them there and uh, and performed the first sacrifice and clothed them with the animal skins and 
and told them about the prophecy of the seed of the woman, well, yeah, they, they learned about their Redeemer that day. They learned about the coming Messiah, the seed of the woman. So that was history in advance, and it was fulfilled in history. And then the prophets rose up in Israel, and God gave them history in advance. I mean, uh, one of the uh, all-encompassing outlines is Daniel chapter 2. Gives us an outline of the entire world history till the consummation. Anyway, we'll talk more about these things, your calls and questions, uh, when we come back. You're listening across the border. My name's Nicholas, and this is our Prophecy Reality Edition. Don't go anywhere. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. When it comes to prophecy today, much of the evangelical Christian world has their eyes on Israel, waiting and watching to see when the third temple will begin to be built. The plans are drawn, the Jewish people are eager, most evangelical Christians today believe that the rapture will happen before the third temple is built. Hi, I'm Michael Eugene. I was taught that Daniel's 70th week was in the future. Is that really what the Bible teaches? Have we searched the scriptures and found this to be true? Why is it so important for a reestablished Israel to build a third temple in Jerusalem? Is it necessary to build a temple on the same location already occupied by the Dome of the Rock? Is it necessary for sacrifices to take place in the temple on Temple Mount? Is there really a rapture followed by seven years of tribulation? What is the New Testament temple? Can we identify history and prophecy? Who is the first beast in Revelation chapter 13? Who are the seven kings in Revelation 17? I have asked all these questions and I have found Nicholas Arthur's new book, When the Third Temple is Built, answers all these questions and more using scripture to interpret scripture. The Bible says that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. Nicholas shows us in his new book, When the Third Temple is Built, how the Bible interprets prophecy and not man's private interpretation. Visit crosstheborder.org, C-R-O-S-S, crosstheborder.org to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on Internet or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for Missionary Radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. Then, when you subscribe, we will send you the last quarterly MP3 CD of that program immediately and continue to do so with each new quarter. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host, cause, and anywhere else the Spirit may lead you. Do all to the glory of our God and Creator for His holy nation, the only kingdom that will last forever. Thank you for listening. (sighs) 
Well, welcome back. You're listening across the border, our Prophecy Reality Edition. Uh, no agenda today, no topic really. We're just uh, talking about, uh, well, a little bit about prophecy and uh, how to interpret what the Bible says about the future. Um, is God, has God appointed us to wrath? Well, the answer is no. Does that mean that we're going to be raptured? out before uh, all of the calamity of the uh, entire book of Revelation ensues upon the earth in, in a three and a half or seven year period? Uh, no, I can't find all of that in the scripture anywhere. And I've wrote several books on it. My latest one, uh, When the Third Temple is Built, um, and the title uh, indicating that there is the belief of those who hold to the pre-tribulation rapture or any of the three tribulation you know the multiple choice prophecy that god gave us isn't that funny how god gave us a multiple choice prophecy which one do you like choose the one you want you know i think god could have been a little more concise on that rapture deal so that people weren't so confused <laughs> well it would go through it uh, line by line in the book there, uh, what you can expect when they start to build the temple. Huh? Actually, I'm kind of excited for them to start building the temple. And that way people can find out that they're not going to be raptured when it happens. And it's kind of a, um, what do they call it, a rock and a hard place for, for those that have uh, come up with this scheme because, you know, it's their play and they, they do have a couple safeties in there. That's the thus the multiple choice when people are raptured away immediately. They go, well, gosh, you know, uh, the pre-tribulation rapture that must have been wrong. It's it must be the mid-trib because because we can still say if it's mid-trib, and the pre-trib position has already gone by after they start building the temple, they can say, well, God has not appointed us to wrath. Therefore, but what wrath? You know. Um, are we going to have a Jacob in revolution where they're going to start killing Christians now? It's just, uh, it's like the world's going crazy out there. But I don't know. I think it may all be media hype because nobody I know is very excited about it at all. Yeah. And not excited about, you know, the thing. I mean, I watched the, the, uh, Helsinki conference. I watched it from beginning to end. You know, the, the press conference between Trump and Putin and, and there. And I thought most of the questions were pretty lame. Like, do you have any dirt on President Trump? They're asking a, another world leader if he has dirt on the president. <laughs> well, oh yeah, I got some dirt here. Let me give it to you. Uh, just, that's just crazy stuff. I've never seen anything like that. But I, I you know... All Trump did was say, hey, look, you know, we there have been mistakes made on both parts. Um, are you supposed to say, well, my country, right or wrong is right. They never make a mistake. Well, I mean, everyone makes mistakes. Now, all I saw is, God, is he saying something that's honest? So they want to crucify him for that. But, you know, they've been shaking the rattle for, for years now, and hopefully, you know, it's not going to start some kind of revolution or something. But the fact is this, God is in control, and God judges the nations. And he's continued, especially since the French Revolution, to judge Europe over and over and over again. There's been no let-up. I mean, basically, he judges, he waits for repentance, some people repent, but as a nation, the people do not. They continue to apostatize, so much so that the apostasy is in Europe is greater than ever now. Uh, great. I mean, they would, they would rather embrace Islam and Sharia law than embrace the God of the Bible, than, to, than embrace Reformed Christianity once again. Uh, they would rather do that or embrace, you know. Of course, those Catholics, you, you can't deter them. You know, uh, and, and you know, I was ha had a thought this this week, and I was uh, telling my son-in-law um, that if you're uh, if you're not a Protestant, you are a Catholic. It doesn't matter what you are. 
you know. If you're not a Protestant, you're a Catholic. It doesn't matter what you call yourself. You're part of the universal Antichrist Church if you're not a Protestant. Only true Reformed Protestants uh, are not Catholics. Yeah. That's, that's the way it is. That's the way I see it. I mean, you can call yourself a Muslim. You can call yourself an Antichrist. I mean, a, uh, an atheist. You can call yourself a homosexual. You can call yourself a American Indian, whatever, a voodoo guy from, well, it doesn't matter. The, the Pope is embracing them all. They're all part of the universal church, the universal antichrist church, because they are all antichrist, whether they mean to be or not. So they all worship the beast and its image, and they all worship, well, basically they worship Satan, because he's behind it all. The scripture plainly says in the Revelation that it is the dragon that gives them their power. They get their power from the dragon, meaning Satan and the devil. Okay, So anyone who doesn't worship is not part of the Protestant Reformed Church worships Satan. They are of the synagogue of Satan. doesn't matter what they call themselves, what country they're in, what color they are, what gender they are or what non-gender they are. I hate to have to say that there is such thing as non-gender. Well, these people are gender confused. Yeah. And uh, as far as teaching that to children in the public schools, and man, I mean, how can you call yourself a Christian and send your children to these dragon in indoctrination centers? Because remember... Uh, uh, the temptation of Christ, how Jesus was taken up to a high pinnacle and he was tempted and Satan showed him all the kingdoms of the world and Satan said, all of these are mine and I will give them to you. And that was, and, and so Satan is control of all the kingdoms of this world. Okay. He's in charge of them all. They are his. And they're fictions. They're not real, you know. I, I don't know. I was ta uh, had a conversation with Carrie Ann about the flat earth. And, um, you know, I, I've been pretty high up in the mountains here. I used to live up at eight, 9,000 feet in the foothill, I mean, in the mountains here. And on a clear day, I could see all the way across the valley. And... In, in the winter time, the fog would be down below the coastal range. The coastal range is really just some small mountains, really hills compared to the Sierra Nevadas, which where I, is where I was at 8,000 feet. And I could see all the way across the valley. Okay, But on a clear day, you could see all the small towns around. But I could not see um, Fresno 80 miles away. It was out of my field of vision. Yeah, it's out of my field of vision. And I couldn't see Bakersfield. I could only see like the coastal range and a sea of fog. Or at night, you looked out the same view on a clear night, you could see the lights of the neighboring cities and towns. But certain things get out of your view. It would take a miracle to see them, uh, whether the earth was flat or round. So it's called conjecture. The flat earthers use that to say, that how could Jesus, how could he show him all the kingdoms of the world unless the earth was flat? Well, it would have to be miraculous even on a flat earth for him to see all the kingdoms of the world. But the context doesn't require that he see anything. Only that, I mean, do you see what I'm telling you? See, it's a figure of speech. When he showed him all the kingdoms of the world, uh, Satan was bragging about how he owned them and 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 he was intimating to Jesus how he owned all the kingdoms of the world, and they were his. And Jesus knew it was true. See, because the kingdoms of the world are not substance. They're images. Like the state of California is an image. Now, the land where that image is in control is not 
is substance, but the whole earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And everything that's that's in the world, I mean, on the earth belongs to God because he created it all. He is the owner of it. So Satan owns images, not even the real world. He didn't have to see the substance of the real world. Jesus already knew all about it because he created it all in six days. You know, because he was the divine creator. He was the fullness of the Godhead bodily. I just used the scripture word for it. That way no one can argue with me. We won't argue about the Trinity and the, whether he was deity. The scripture plainly says that he was the fullness of the Godhead bodily. That's good enough for me. And uh, and when he said, the, the disciples said, show us the Father and it will suffice us. And his answer was, have I been so long with you and you don't know me? You know, he was the Father in the flesh. He was the fullness of the Godhead bodily, indicating that in that bodily form, well, well, there are limits to what he could do in that bodily form. But, well, what he could do, well, obviously went beyond what we can do. So what he saw uh, when he was tempted, uh, he saw all the kingdoms of the world. He saw in the same way when I explain something to you, you don't have to physically see it to say, yeah, I see. It's a figure of speech. It doesn't prove that the earth is flat or round. It's called conjecture. If you want to take that and say, there, the earth is flat because of that, then it's, that's conjecture. That's the same thing the futurists do with Bible verses to, like the one that we were talking about earlier. God has not appointed us to wrath. It's the same thing. God has not appointed us to wrath, but that doesn't mean that we're going to be raptured out magically, that we're going to escape persecution and the judgment that falls on nations as tribulation. People just take what they want to apply to make themselves feel comfortable. They want that rapture really bad. And, you know, as far as the flat earth goes, and and I, I understand that. When I looked into it first, I thought, oh, this is great stuff, man. And and you buy into it, so, well, of course, you search it deeper and you go, well, there's only what the scripture explicitly says, and then there's conjecture. And if everything they're saying is based solely upon conjecture, which it all is, then, you know, the futurists and the flat earth uh, method of interpreting the Bible is not the way to go, unless you want to be led astray, okay? I mean, I could care less if the earth is flat or round. It doesn't matter to me. What's it got to do with anything? My eye is on a prize and it has nothing to do with the shape of the earth. You know, I mean, I understand the earth is round by observing the sunset by looking at the moon. I, no, that's not a flat disk out there. You know, uh, the other thing about uh, the earth being fixed well, I believe that the earth is the center of God's creation. He created it before he created anything else. The scripture plainly says in the beginning, God created the heaven. So he created the universe first, the time-space continuum. It was empty when he created the earth. Then he created the earth. And it was the only thing in the heaven that God created on the first day, the time-space continuum, what we call the universe. It was the only thing when he created the earth. That was it. That's all there was. Yeah. And then he said when he separated the day from the night, yeah. Well, then that was something else. Then we had light. But it doesn't say anywhere that it was flat. As a matter of fact, it would be impossible for it to be flat because only three dimensional objects can exist in our universe. That's, that's it. You couldn't just create a flat. You know, that's only. Uh, actually, uh, that's only one dimensional, flat, and it has no depth. That doesn't even, like I said, uh, we need 3D objects to, in, to exist in the universe. Otherwise, it's, it's imaginary. It's like the circle. The circle is an Im imaginary thing. It's an, it, it doesn't really exist. It's a concept. We understand it. You know, I, right now I'm in a swivel chair, right, like this. And uh, and if I 
If I swivel around 360 degrees, which I'm not going to do because I'm tied by this wire here on this microphone, and I looked at the horizon, it would appear at the same level all the way around. That doesn't tell you whether the Earth is flat. That only tells you that you cannot make a determination by uh, observing the horizon what the shape of the Earth is. That's all it tells you. And if you're honest, you would concede to that. Yeah. Any honest person, get in your swivel chair. You, you don't even have to, you know, put yourself in the middle of the desert or the ocean or a high mountain or anything. All you gotta do is close your eyes or just draw a line at eye level all the way around. You know? And what you're saying is that, well, if the earth is round, it will curve down. No, it can't. Your vanishing point is at the same level all the way around, whether the earth is flat or round. So observation of the horizon proves nothing. It doesn't prove that the Earth is flat or round. See, and that's the way most of these arguments and the way they twist most of these scripture verses to prove their point are just wrong. It's like saying that, well, if the Earth, you know, well, what's the other one? Um, oh yeah, that, oh yeah. Every eye shall see him. That's another one. That God could only perform that miracle of every eye seeing him if the earth is flat. If it's round, God couldn't pull it off. You know? <laughs> well, your God is about this big then. That's right. Because the God that I worship, I can't even conceive. And I know that he could do anything. That if he wants every eye to see him on a round earth or a flat earth, it would take the same uh, amount of determination. So that, that scripture proves nothing because it's going to still be a miraculous thing, you know, because if he, if he appears in Jerusalem and you're in San Francisco, well, that's a long, 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 long way away. That would be miraculous for him to see you even on a flat earth. See, so all these, these are just, uh, specious, empty arguments that sound good. And they just use them to reel people in. And actually, I think the whole flat earth psyop is just there to help discredit God's word. Because nowhere in the Bible, I got my post on my website, flat earth or spherical earth, what does the Bible say? And uh, I've been there as honest as I can. I've uh, tried to see what the scripture actually explicitly says about the shape of the earth. And it says very little. But what very little it says is very revealing, and nowhere does it intimate whatsoever that the earth is flat. That's it. That's all there is to it. So check out that article for yourself. And I know it's easy, you know, because we, you know, us Protestants who are, who are true protesters, we're, we're iconoclastic at heart. You know, we love to tear down images. And we love to turn over the lies and, and, and find the truth. So it's easy for us to uh, get, you know, reeled in easily by things like that. Yes, and you know, I have a footstool in my kitchen too, you know. And I use it to reach higher cabinets. The little ones use it to do the dishes, you know, the ones that can't quite reach the sink. And also, is Jesus really, you know, is this a figure of speech, the footstool? Absolutely. Or is Jesus really kicking back, watching his big screen TV with his feet up on the earth? I mean, come on, it's a figure of speech. Yeah, science proves. Well, I just told you how you cannot observe, you know, by observation of the horizon, you cannot determine whether the world is round or not. And I don't believe the earth is spinning. Yeah. It has nothing to do with the shape of the earth. Okay? So that has nothing to do with the shape of the earth, whether it's spinning or not. I've never believed the earth is spinning. You know? Now, if you were on the moon, okay, the moon always doesn't spin. It always faces the earth. I don't believe it's flat. 
my observation, I know that it is a spherical moon, okay, even though I, we only see one side of it. But now, if you got, if you were able to go to the moon, which I don't believe any man's ever been on the moon, I've never seen any convincing evidence of it. Okay? I don't believe that man's been above three or four hundred feet. Maybe they sent some probes deeper than that, but uh, man, no, I don't think so. Uh, they have problems about four hundred, uh, not feet, but miles. Okay. Um, so, but if you were on the moon and you were looking at the Earth it would appear as though the earth was spinning one revolution per 25 hours because the moon goes around the earth a little slower than the sun so about once every 25 hours if you were on the moon observing the earth because the moon once the the we only see one side of the moon it doesn't spin at all so you'd have to be on that side you were looking at the earth it would look like it was spinning one revolution about every 24 to 25 hours. So it would look like the Earth is spinning. That would be relative to where you are if you were on the moon. It would appear that the Earth was spinning. Okay? Now, uh, does the Earth spin? I don't believe it does. I have no way. They've done experiments and no one's been able to prove that the Earth spins. But that doesn't mean that it's flat. That doesn't prove that it's flat. No. So, you know, I'm in agreement with you on that, Carrie, that uh, the Earth doesn't spin. And I believe that the, act, the sun actually, because God created the sun, what, on what the third or fourth day, I forget exactly, one of those days later, but it wasn't on the first day that he created the sun, uh, the, sun the moon, and the stars. Yeah, and he put them in the heaven that he created on the first day, not the heaven that he created on the sec second day when he divided the waters from the waters and he called you know, the waters above from the waters below. You have clouds up there, you know, they're made out of water. And the, the second firmament that he created on the second day where the birds fly uh, per the creation account, they fly in that firmament that he created on the second day between the waters above and the waters below. Okay. So, so I agree with you, you know, but I really don't know. You know, I could be wrong. When, when God said the earth is fixed and it shall not be moved, I, I don't know if that's just a figure of speech or not. It seems to be a fact of reality, at least relative to my being on the earth, but like I said, I know if I was on the moon, the earth would be spinning, would appear to be spinning from the moon, because we know that if the moon goes around the earth and you're facing the same face, uh, face as the earth, that it would appear that the earth was spinning one revolution every 24 to 25 hours. <laughs> so, but... Uh, Fortunately, I don't, we're not on the moon, and but you know that's the way it works. That's that's the way it would appear. So, relative to what is the Earth spinning? You know, relative to me being on the Earth, no, it's not spinning. I, I just I have problems with that. And plus, they have they they can look at planets that actually do spin, and there's some pretty wild stuff going on on those planets as far as currents and you know stuff and gases and stuff on on those that have atmosphere and that these planets are spinning there's that i think that's what the earth would look like if it was doing that kind of thing too so but obviously the earth doesn't always face the sun so the sun either goes around the earth or the earth is spinning you know i don't know but none of that proves that the earth is flat. And we're just going to leave it there. Anyway, we're going to jump into history of apocalyptic interpretation for the second hour. Because I am all talked out. <laughs> and, and we're going to continue with that. So may the Almighty bless you and keep you as you continue walking in his kingdom on the narrow way that leads to life. Please do not depart from it. See you next time.
book of Revelation says, the spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus Christ. This is at the very heart of FirstAmendmentRadio.com. In that spirit, we have created the Prophecy Reality News app for all of your mobile devices. Streaming First Amendment Radio 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Available for your Apple, Android device, and smartphone absolutely free. Get the Prophecy Reality News app installed today so you can listen to First Amendment Radio wherever you are. The Prophecy Reality News app. Get it now. Since the beginning of time, kings have sought it, nations have fought for it, it has been traded, it has been borrowed, it has been purchased, it has been stolen, there's a reason for it. To secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and to our posterity, invest with the security of gold and silver. Call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188 or visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net. Listen to Financial Survival with your host, Melody Cedarstrom, right here on FirstAmendmentRadio.com at 4 p.m. Eastern or 1 p.m. Pacific Time. Visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net or call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188. Toll free, 1-800-375-4188. 